Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 102 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Modern Bar Cart CEO Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another excellent interview episode where we trick some of the greatest minds in the spirits and cocktail industry into thinking that they're just having a casual little chat with me when, in reality, they're totally spilling all of their boozy secrets right into your headphones. This time around, I had the chance to catch up with my friend R.B. Wolfensberger, who's the head distiller over at Grey Wolf Craft Distilling. He has a new product hitting the market right now, and it's not your typical gin or whiskey. This is something completely different and relatively rare in the U.S. craft distilling space. But before I tell you exactly what it is, I think this would be a wonderful time for you to make yourself a drink. This week's featured cocktail is the Paloma, which is just about the most refreshing tequila cocktail you'll ever encounter. Aside from the margarita, it's one of the most widely available tequila drinks, and yet there's still a great deal of disagreement on the actual recipe. And that's partially because the Paloma is a highball cocktail, which means that you've got a little wiggle room when making it. Put differently, if you were to fiddle with an Old Fashioned or a Negroni or a Daiquiri, you know, one of those classic boozy lower volume cocktails, you'd definitely be able to tell right away. But with a Paloma, you've got grapefruit soda filling up a large portion of the glass, which means tweaking the citrus a bit or adding another flavor isn't nearly as likely to ruin or drastically alter the drink. The simplest recipe I found, and the one I like the most, is from imbibe.com. And that recipe states, that to make the Paloma cocktail, you'll need two ounces of Blanco or Reposado tequila, the juice from half a lime, a pinch of salt, and grapefruit soda, like jarritos. Combine the first three ingredients in a highball glass or a large rocks glass with ice, top up with grapefruit soda, and give everything a quick stir before garnishing with a nice, bright lime wheel. Some recipes out there call for grapefruit juice in addition to grapefruit soda. Some call for simple syrup and seltzer water, but if you want my opinion, keep things simple. Definitely add that pinch of salt to acknowledge that this is the margarita's world and we're all just living in it. And make sure to sip this delicious cocktail outside on a porch or a rooftop deck with a great view of the sunset. So, now that you've got yourself an amazing Paloma cocktail... Let's turn our attention to the subject of this week's episode, which is not tequila. This episode is part two of a little mini-series we're running on Mexican-inspired distilling methods and base ingredients. In episode 101, we chatted with Max and Eli from the Baltimore Spirits Company about their mezcal-style apple brandies. And this episode, we shift our focus from the distilling methods to the quintessential Mexican distillate base, agave. Some of the topics R.B. and I discuss include how his new American agave spirit called Lobo fits in with the other products in the Grey Wolf portfolio, which we taste and nose as we go. The differences between using an agave heart or piña versus using an agave nectar as the base for a distilled spirit. Why barrel aging agave spirits is traditionally very different than most other barrel aging approaches and what RB is doing to kind of shake things up and set his product apart. The challenges of introducing a non-tequila, non-mezcal agave spirit into an American market that takes comfort in traditional agave categories and classifications. An on-air cocktail demo using the Lobo to make a dry, refreshing riff on an agave Manhattan meditations on the late great distiller Dave Pickerel, and much, much more. If you're in the Mid-Atlantic, I really hope you make a point to check out Grey Wolf Craft Distilling, which is based out of the Lion Distilling Company facility in beautiful St. Michael's, Maryland. Also, you may have noticed from this episode, we're beginning to play around with live streaming our interviews as we build up to a full-on video podcast. We stream this episode on Instagram Live, but 
we're not married to a particular platform just yet. So please do drop us an email at podcast at modernbarcart.com and let us know if you have a preferred way to enjoy live video programming from your favorite podcasters. And with that, I hope you enjoy this agave-driven conversation and tasting with R.B. Wolfensberger of Grey Wolf Craft Distilling. R.B., welcome back to the podcast. It's good to be here. It's good to be here. So can you introduce yourself to uh, the listeners mm-hmm. who were not fortunate enough to catch you last time you were on in the vodka episode? All right. Yeah, absolutely. My name is R.B. Wolfensberger. I'm the lead distiller and co-founder of Grey Wolf Craft Distilling in St. Michael's, Maryland. We are a very nano small distillery that's located inside another nano small distillery, the Lion Distilling Company. Uh, We have a very unique relationship there where the uh, Lion Distilling folks knew me, uh, were uh, privy to my trouble getting my distillery started in various different locations and uh, They, when I hit another snag, they came to Grey Wolf and said, hey, why don't you join up with us? We make rum. We don't have intentions of making vodka and gin. We know you do. We want to give you an opportunity. Nice. To, uh, yeah, it was was a very uh, selfless, cool thing for another distillery to step up and say, we want to see you succeed. Um, So, yeah, we landed there two and a half years ago. We got our first product out and the rest is a blur. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that is a, that's a good way to put it. Um, so uh, I, when we when we did the vodka episode, we yeah. spoke in depth about, I guess, vodka in general mm-hmm. and your yeah. approach to vodka in particular. So we do have a couple of these cute little uh, trial yeah. size bottles that yeah. uh, that Megan dropped off with me. Yeah. So I'll I'll do a little a quick little taste through, and we'll kind of get up mm-hmm. to speed on your line. Yeah. And the main focus of this episode, the star of the show so to speak, is agave, yeah. and in particular, this beautiful bottle here, uh, which is a new release uh, from, from your company called Lobo. It's, it's an American agave product. Now, this episode is following swiftly on the heels of an interview that I did with our friends Max and Eli over mm-hmm. at the Baltimore Spirits yes. Company, and they do a an agave distilling method, but not using agave. So, okay. so a Mexican style, kind of like a smoked apple brandy in the style of mezcal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they also do a pachuga. Yep. So we, we worked through that and I want this to be kind of the partner episode to that because they're doing the distillation style that, that is mm-hmm. inspired from south of the border. And mm-hmm. now we're working with a base distillate ingredient that is very south of the border yeah. in, in this agave. So yeah. first of all, I, we, we should probably crack into these uh, numero uno Absolutely. agave cervezas brewed by our friends over at Flying Dog. Yeah. Beautiful Ralph Stedman art. Uh, <laughs> so let's crack into those with our Dos Equis glasses here. Actually, <laughs> Hecho and Mexico, they look hand blown. I can't verify that. But uh, yeah, we've got some. So we'll, we'll enjoy these. And also kind of taste through uh, the first two products that you released being a vodka and a gin. But they're not just a vodka and a gin, right? They're a very special vodka and a very special gin. So why don't you take me through those and and we'll kind of taste them. So with with all of our products, the the one thing I saw when we started the distillery is that craft distilling was growing and growing fast. So one of the kind of twists I wanted to put on every spirit was just make it unique, make it a little innovative and different. Uh, let's try to stand apart if we're we're going to make a vodka, you know, like that, that, but let's make it a little different. So with every product that I go through, keep that in mind, vodka, uh, a lot of people make it, not very many make single malt vodka, 100% malted barley in the mash bill. It has a lot of character. The federal regulation is that it must have a neutral character, but that always kind of made me laugh because what's neutral to you might not be neutral to me. And it's as the distiller, I've got the uh, ability to say this is neutral to me, you yeah. know, and uh, and I actually like vodkas that do have character. So we made a vodka that has a little malt sweetness to it. And also malt itself is really mellow to taste. It it has a very soft mouthfeel, to use a a wine term. Um, Right. Very viscous. Um, So I really liked that. I thought it was different. And once again, that fit the description of trying to do a vodka, but make that vodka unique. 
you know, you get that sweetness right on the nose, and it's a very agricultural sweetness, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's it's Absolutely. like it's like smelling. Absolutely, it's like you're smelling the sugars in in the um in the in the barley itself. Yes. And, and barley's problematic, right? Barley is probably one of the most labor intensive spirits to distill, along with a couple of others. But but it, it's difficult to get to that place where the sugar becomes accessible to the yeast, right? Yeah. It, however, I will tell you that uh, I, I, barley, if you're working with all grain, it drains like a dream. Yeah. Now, so it's a, it's the malted barley itself. Mm-hmm. So um, a little bit more work on the front end, but on the back end when you yes, have to clean out the fermenter. It, yeah, I mean, my, my, my farmers love it when they're picking up the barley because they know that that's not going to be as hard for them to then give it, giving it back to their hogs and uh, and their cattle. It's, it's not going to be as labor intensive for them. The yeah. rye, different story. For sure. So what proof is the vodka? It is uh, 80 proof. Okay. And I thought about maybe ticking that up a little bit, but we wanted that real mellow, smooth, uh, soft finish. And I figured uh, one of the complaints I often heard about vodka was it just was like rubbing alcohol. Right. So, you know, we, we brought it down to 80 and thought that that would give us it, its mellow. Right. Yes. And you can see, I mean, yeah, like I, got, I don't like using the term legs too much when it comes to spirits. But right. It's got them. It you does. Know. It does. And I, you know, I think that people, if they want that effect, that, that slightly more bracing uh-huh. effect, yeah. you can just stick it in the freezer Yeah, <laughs> and, you, and you get a little bit of that. Yeah. So, um, I, I, this is, this is, I think an achievement. We, we talked about this uh, at length in the vodka episode. So mm-hmm. if anybody is interested in learning a, a lot about this particular spirit, definitely go search back in our archives, give that a listen. But I think that this is a real achievement. Um, h- how has it been received overall? You know, I, I all of my products thus far, I, the people that uh, a lot of I, great feedback, uh, a lot of people that really enjoy it, that tell me that it's now their go to with both the vodka and the gin. And I'm hoping Lobo the same thing. But the only real negatives I ever get is people that are purists of categories. People that, you know, this is what I expect vodka or gin to taste like. You have gone too far, sir. You know, <laughs> with like trying to uh, create something different. And and I'm fine with that. Yeah. You know, like I, I didn't, I you know, uh, there was an old saying that craft beer got nowhere being Budweiser. So we're not going to try to be a Grey Goose. And, sure. You know, and we're not going to try to be Tangare. And we're most definitely not trying to be like tequila or mezcal yeah with this you know yeah and that's why i'm excited to talk about the the agave but but so to continue on with the story of your of your brand we've got this sassafras finished gin here so this is the timber Mm -hmm. um timber gin and how did this evolve out of the vodka or was it a completely separate thing no it did evolve um the base for the vodka and the gin 100 percent malted barley is the same and most of that came from the fact that we love the base that we got. We, we love the base of the vodka and kind of the, what we talked about a second ago, the mouthfeel and the, and the, the kind of like neutral uh, character that was there. And we said, hey, if we got, you know, this, if we think we got this right, then let's use the same base, but let's work on botanicals that would you know be different right uh, i'd start with about 16 different botanicals we landed Ooh. on eight yeah um eight being juniper of course mm-hmm. predominant 50 percent of my gin basket is juniper uh the rest i kind of ran wild with lemon peels orange peels black peppercorn uh rose hips hibiscus mm. elderflower and cardamom you know, I think the elderflower and the cardamom really come through nicely. I love it when people taste it because everybody picks up on different things. You know, sometimes people say to me, like, I'm getting the peppery spice. And then other people get the citrus. Yeah, well, I think right when I poured it, because this has been sitting in a very small bottle, and this is yes. the first time it's getting access to air. So when I first poured it, I think I got those expressed kind of citrusy notes with the orange and the lemon. Mm-hmm. And then... It, that really almost ammonia style cardamomy thing mm. came through, but it was yeah. rounded out by the elderflower. So it didn't, yeah. you know, if you stick your if you stick your face in a bag of like decorticated cardamom, uh-huh. it smells like just ammonia. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's such a it's such a beautiful botanical when used yeah. in in conjunction with other things. So it was probably the surprise out of all of the uh, different 
botanicals I was working with, it's the one that surprised me the most how much I'd liked it. Yeah. And then once we collect this distillate, the gin, uh, we then rest it on sassafras wood staves for about two to three months. And this is a very similar uh, kind of approach as barreling, except we're going into stainless steel mm. with sassafras, center cut sassafras wood staves that we let it rest on and it finishes. It doesn't get like a uh, color ration, like the coloration isn't like a barrel. You right. know, it's, a, it's a little bit um, more diluted, but it, it finishes with like a little bit of a hard maple candy mm. um, kind of uh, finish to it. And I really think the, the the finishing on the sassafras wood staves is our, you know, signature. Yeah, it's difference good. with this. It's kind of in the barrel aging conversation because mm-hmm. it's wood uh, mm-hmm. and, and yet... It's something that's completely itself. Where, where'd you come up with the idea of sassafras? Like, what was that light bulb moment where you were like, I know what we'll do? <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of funny because at first I thought about, you know, and, and at the very beginning we were barreling and putting sassafras wood in. And we thought maybe we're getting too much out of the barrels here where it's, it's, it's we're getting too much of the oak. We really like what the sass right. is. But back to your question, it was something where I said, I want to do some type of finishing with this gin. And I thought about doing it in port barrels. Something like a port rested gin. Interesting. But we didn't know if the barrels themselves had been treated at all. Oh, with the ca- sul- sulfur? Yeah. yeah. And like when we got in that conversation, it just kind of was like, well, we're not even going to attempt to mess up this at the very beginning. Let's look at something else. And I looked through some exotic woods that uh, a barrel maker had. And one of them was sassafras. And I remembered growing up like the sassafras like plant. And mm-hmm. that it's got you, those little mitten yeah, shaped you leaves. chew on the stalks and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And it was the original sarsaparilla with root beer. So I just kind of said, yeah. why not? And on top of that, it was kind of fun to say. Yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Then to, just to go back about the, the port barrels, because this is something that, that people might not know. So uh, a lot of, uh, I would say, industrial port manufacturers yeah. will reuse barrels. And yeah. what they want to do is they want to kind of make sure there's no contamination. Because unlike with spirits, which are at a proof where it's, it's so gonna, high, it's like, going to kill yeah. anything in there. Yeah. Oh, well, fortified wines are kind of walking that. They're, they're walking right the on the line. They're literally fortified up to the point where they can be exactly. shelf stable. Exactly. Yeah. So what a lot of big commercial port houses will do is they'll they'll kind of sanitize, quote unquote, their barrels with, yeah. with sulfur. sulfur. And unfortunately what happens, and correct me if I'm wrong, mm-hmm. what happens a lot of the time is American companies in particular get these barrels from brokers and yes. the brokers have, have kind of a no double idea. blind thing yeah, going on. They're, they're literally the middleman and you know, to, for them to go back and find the actual winemakers that put this together mm-hmm. and ask them, Hey, did you sulfur candle this barrel before it came to us? Yep. You know, is almost impossible. Right. And I think there's a little bit of, uh, I think there's a little bit of intentionality in that. You, yes. you kind of want to have that uh, yeah. deniability, plausible yeah, deniability. Exactly. And, and so what you're saying is that, you know, to have that question mark hanging over yeah. your product was not something that you wanted going exactly, into it. Exactly, exactly. It was it was uh, something that we just didn't see the 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 risk was too high. Yeah, absolutely. You know, for the reward. And when we I was pitching out other ideas, like some of these things, like sassafras came up, and it was just like, is anyone else doing that? We don't think so. Mm-hmm. So let's let's roll with this because totally. you know it's once again different. And uh, that's what we were kind of going for. So, and, and you know, a lot of it's luck. You know, we, we got some samples. We ran so, a few samples on different types of wood other than sassafras. We like the sassafras the best, but mm-hmm. we, we kind of were leaning that way already. So it made for a quicker transition and I couldn't be more pleased. That's good. Yeah. It's, so it's interesting. I mean, I would describe it as a darker, quote unquote, darker mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. gin. A dark's a very vague word, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think that this fits really well into a conversation between a really botanically focused gin and more of like some of the barrel agier ones that are coming out like a noteworthy large market one would be blue coats barrel Mm -hmm. aged gin Mm -hmm. you know i can see this kind of sitting right between like a mcclintock forager and a blue coat barrel aged because it's got aspects of both um, but it is still very much in its own space 
With this gin, uh, it's so unique. What have people doing like been doing with cocktails using uh, it? You know, I mean, I've had such cool um, cocktails that I, I really love giving it to accounts and and letting them yeah kind of work with it as opposed to encouraging them. And it might say something about my style of what I like in a cocktail, but a uh, little citrus, you know, little bitters, little sugar. In spirit mm-hmm. and release it, you yeah. know, and, 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 sour. and yeah, and uh, we've had uh, people with some like honey simples mm. and just like a little bit of lemon juice, and you, the gin still shines through. Sure, and that's important to me because uh, I I don't want a cocktail made with any of my spirits where you can't tell what the base is because that's the right. whole that's what we do. Yeah, you want that you fingerprint know? to to go to go all the way through and I it, for me if I were designing cocktails with this gin I would either go dark dark mm-hmm. or bright bright. Uh-huh. Because dark dark is going to like make people question whether it's a gin cocktail. Yeah. And then bright bright is going to be like, "Whoa, like here's this like really like soury sour like 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 imagine just a Collins or yeah. something yeah. like that where you where you use the, the timber gin it's like whoa like is this is this gin it's it, it's do, it's definitely gin but it's doing a different thing than yeah. i would expect a gin to do i, I tell you I, I love a negroni but i think sometimes uh i lose the gin mm-hmm. in the negroni and as much as i love the cocktail i just don't see the balance sometimes so as much as i love a negroni I don't make a whole lot of them with my gin, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm relaxing. For sure. For sure. Well, these are two really unique products. And the reason why I wanted to taste through these first is mm-hmm. to kind of give people a through line of the narrative of your company and, and your products so that so that when we get to the Lobo, like mm-hmm. we are about to launch into, it, it kind of makes sense, you know, what you're doing with your company. Yes. So um, let's start very basic and tell us when you decided you were going to start experimenting with agave and how you went about that. So agave was one of those things that I, I saw people that were importing and selling it in the U S at conventions. So that's where the conversation started, where I talked to some people at a few distillers conventions that said, you know, we can bring this to you if you want. Um, agave spirits or agave, literally, agave, agave nectar. Agave, okay. agave nectar. Um, so I just kind of thought, you know, uh, I'll run some experiments with it. So I, I did run some experiments, both failed and succeeded, uh, but kept it in real small amounts. I got roughly about three gallons of distillate that I liked. Good. I put it in a barrel and I stashed it away. The whole time we're keeping our head down, we're working on vodka gin, vodka gin, vodka gin. One day I took a sample out of it, Uh tasted it myself, kind of like shook my head, couldn't like believe what it became in the barrel, Uh took some samples out to the team uh, with Grey Wolf and Lion Distilling and let them all taste it. And the resounding thought was, you got to keep doing this. Mm Mm-hmm. And it encouraged me to say, okay, well, you know, that's what I'm all about with Grey Wolf. We want to do different types of spirits. Mm -hmm. Not very many people are doing this. So it just added fuel to my fire to go out and get more of it and keep like working on it and try to get it right and see if we could make this thing happen. Yeah. You know, and uh, that, that's where it started. It was about a year and a half process of, you know, tweaking what we thought we liked and it just kind of came together in the end at this point yeah i'm sure it's going to change a little bit going (sighs) forward because that's what we do it just looks so pretty i just want to touch it oh thanks Uh. (laughs) (laughs) um it's funny like we uh we're now smoking french oak in house i am experimenting with charring some woods myself and then resting the spirit on it. Some of what it, in it is barrel aged. Mm-hmm. Some of it was just Blanco. Okay. But like I kind of like just like the way it was. And I, I did a little blend for batch one of the different things I've been working on. And I liked it. And I said, let's roll with this. Uh, and now we're going to probably 
you know, probably take it up a notch in maybe certain levels and scale it back at other levels. I don't know. It'll be a fun ride over the next successive probably four or five batches uh, to see what we learn because we're still learning with this. It's it's, it's uh, definitely something that's different. Yeah, because agave is almost exclusively imported to the U.S., you don't think think about small batch agave yeah you're not like yeah. it's like oh i've got this small batch. well you kind of think about that with mezcal mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. but there's a couple so a couple of things that i want to talk about here in general is the fact that you are barrel aging now i feel yeah. like most people when they walk down the tequila aisle are used to seeing you know the silver or blanco mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. they're used to seeing the reposado and the añejo mm-hmm. and There's some interesting stuff going on here because if you know how barrels work and if you know how evaporation in barrels (laughs) works, you know that the further toward the equator you go, the more evaporation is going to occur inside those barrels. And now Mexico is very different than Kentucky or somewhere else. Like even think of like Scotland, they're getting one to 2% evaporation a year. Whereas down in the Caribbean, they're getting like 10 to 14% evaporation per year. So that's the kind of gradient that we're working on. And, And so as a result in tequila, as far as I understand it, a reposado is something like what six months or a year. Yeah, it's a, I I can't tell you the exact uh, number, but I know repo to me always was like almost kissing a barrel. Right. You know, it's it re- similar, literally was rested there. Similar to what we do with our gins, where it's not a huge period, long period of time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think a lot of people know that. And like in right. Yeho, uh, very old. It's like two years. Yeah. yeah. Which like, you know, as some whiskey traditionalists would be like, what? That's it? That's you know, um Like I still remember what I had for dinner two years ago. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. So, you know, I guess I have two questions pertaining to the wood aspect. Yeah. Uh, and then what maybe we can do is then return back to agave agave and like mm-hmm, talk mm-hmm, about the mm-hmm, sugar mm-hmm. and the fermentation. Yep, Cause yep. it seems like it's kind of interesting, but I think the color is probably what's striking to most people, especially yeah. you folks who are watching us on Instagram live <laughs> right now. So talking about wood, obviously you're putting this in barrels in Maryland. Yeah. Which is very different then from down there, uh, from down in Mexico, and it, a trend that's emerging right now in the international spirits market, especially with rum, is people buying rum in a barrel and aging it somewhere cold, like Scotland, <laughs> yeah, and, and and you know, or the, or, or some, elsewhere in Europe, and sure. so that's big. And so I'm seeing kind of a similar thing where where you're taking like a distillate base coming from down there, and then doing something with barrels that kind of mirrors that. Yeah. But I'm I'm wondering if there's room for you to age longer because there's less evaporation. Quite possibly, you know, I I, I would say that I probably have a great answer for that, but it's probably not a great answer. <laughs> but the answer is, I don't know. Right. Uh, because it's such a new product that um, we asked me this question in a couple of years. Totally. You know? Um, oh, I'm totally jumping the gun because like right yeah. now the key is, you know, you just said that like the batches are going to, you know, you're going to tighten some stuff yeah. up. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to tug on certain strings over the course of the next few batches. And so you got to get to that place where it's like completely locked in before you can even have the conversation about, sure, oh, sure. we're going to stick this in a barrel for five years. <laughs> and, and and I don't know if you did do something like that, if it would be worth it, because you may take this amazing spirit by itself mm-hmm. and muddy the water. A yeah, just bit. over oak it. Yeah. like yeah. Uh, So that's, uh, this is, that's why I love what I do. Mm-hmm. I, I embrace the unknown yeah you know where it's like uh i think for someone anyone who is in marketing or um more traditional like kind of spirits it would probably drive them crazy if someone said "Eh, it's gonna change a little bit you know like they they might be like what like this no it has to be consistent you have to make it the exact same way stay on message stay on message and i think it's going to continue to be you know the same there's just all those little nuances. Um, mm-hmm. Like I was saying, like we, I've been charring some oak myself and experimenting with different chars. I've right. been smoking. Yeah, that's interesting to me because I think when I think of like staves or barrels, I think toasted or charred. Yeah. I don't think smoked. Smoking's different. And like that just literally came out of uh, reading Firewater 
by the guys from down in Corsair. Um, they do a lot of smoked spirits. And uh, they they just talked about smoking barrels. And once again, I'm, I'm working with really smaller barrels right now with this product. So I kind of thought about it. If you, you know, if I could smoke some oak and then uh, kind of give it certain periods of time to see how much that smoke came out, pronounced out. And the thing was, once again, I don't want to be, it's like mezcal. You know, I don't want people to say that. Like, I yeah. want it to be an American agave spirit that's different. American so, agave. Yeah. So, um, there is smoke in there, but as we will taste Ooh. Yeah. and smell, you'll get a hint of it. But just a hint. But we didn't go too far. Yeah, because I was looking for it, and I got it right away, uh -huh. but it wasn't like... But if I didn't say anything, it might take a little bit it, where... I had a friend of mine, like, taste it too fast before I got a chance to tell him what I was doing with it, and he was like... Is that smoke? You know, like, so it does come through, you know. Oh, man. I get this lovely graham crackery aroma. Yeah. It's like, yeah. oh, man. Total honey. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Maybe a little butterscotch. It's all yep. kind of in that orbiting honey, yep. honey butterscotch graham cracker. Yep. Wow. And see, that's, that's part of the challenge with this also is immediately someone wants to put it into a category and says, well, what is it more like a tequila or more like a mezcal? Is it, is this Blanco? Is this in Yeho? You know, like, and I, 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 I mean, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> you know? To me, it's Lobo. It's a different, it's, it's Lobo. It's, it's itself. What does Lobo know? mean? Uh, it's a uh, Spanish for wolf. So, wolf. Okay. You know, like, oh, we, like Lupo. Uh, okay. yeah, 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 yeah. So we, we, uh, uh, and uh, growing up, I had a pet named Lobo, too. So it was something that when I, I had told my father that I was going to make an agave spirit, his response immediately was, you should call it Lobo. And I, Isn't I said, it nice when marketing decisions get yeah, made that simple? Exactly. And I looked at him and I was like, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> Man, so I just took my first, uh, my first sip here. And it is, uh, there's a mouthfeel here. I think I think one of the... Hallmarks of your product line is mouthfeel. Yes, I, I don't. Yeah. I don't think anyone would be able to dispute that. You have such rich products, and I guess getting us into that conversation about what agave is, because mm -hmm. it's a different type of sugar, mm -hmm. right? And 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 how we achieve this mouthfeel, like like what is the deal with agave, and how did we go from the raw product that you imported mm -hmm. to this really lovely mouthfeel and flavor? So the one thing that's interesting about agave from a distiller's perspective and also a little maddening is it's very slow and deliberate in its fermentation. What I can tell you about uh, the beginning ingredients, the raw agave I get, it's raw, unrefined, whole cane agave nectar. Mm -hmm. So it's consistency of like a honey. Right. And so they, they, they take the big pinas, right? So I feel like what most people associate with agave is like the romance of the mezcal palenque mm -hmm. where they're mm -hmm. kind of hand macheting these things and yes. then they put them in the ground they roast them because agave very very much like your barley is is a problematic sugar source and that yes. you need to process it quite a bit yeah. so you're getting this from a facility that does that processing and then yields a kind of a, a type of honey um yeah, the, do they the have best, different grades the best way i can explain yeah they do and the best way i can explain it is it's kind of like sap Mm -hmm. you know from the agave plant yeah um like maple and, so almost like maple syrup yes down in the other and part and of and America. they have different levels where you can get a light amber the yeah. whole way to unrefined dark amber yeah. which is even more problematic to deal with because there's a lot of unfermentable sugars in that dark stuff to it's it's almost like a molasses with right right um so and that's another thing i'm still working with where i'm trying to use some of those big flavorful like darker agaves uh and when i say flavorful i mean from the point before i start fermenting with it mm -hmm. um and some of the lighter ones are a wee bit easier to deal with um but it's still the same sugar source mm -hmm. 
one of the things I've noticed with the agave is uh, I, I kind of thought about it as I, I kind of not a helicopter parent, but I got to be a helicopter distiller Yeah, <laughs> where I'm just constantly sticking my nose in there, temperatures, um, gravities, uh, pHs, like, oh. you know, just like the things that you have to keep in check and which, you almost have to baby this to the end. Which is funny because like whenever I talk to distillers, like... I feel like I'm talking to a scientist because in, in like a lot of people come from engineering backgrounds yeah, yeah, and stuff. Yeah. I have none of that stuff. Yeah. And so like, they're like, well, you see, so the pH and the specific gravity. And I'm like, dude, you're already over my head and you can keep going if you want. But um, well, I mean, like we, we had talked off, off uh, Mike earlier about college and we, yeah. we both went to the same college. Well, I wasn't like an exceptional student, but I was good at organic chemistry. Which is odd. Very strange. Yes. It's that's the Widowmaker course for like, that was like my sister's Widowmaker course. (laughs) And and she like for, for med school. Yeah. I told, I told somebody one time when they were like, really? I'm like, yeah, I wasn't like this, uh, exceptional student, but I tutored exceptional students in organic chemistry (laughs) cause they were obsessed with getting the A and I just, I just kind of got it. Yeah. You know? Um, Oh, that's so cool. So, all right. So to summarize, we've got this agave, it comes to you from a facility that can offer different grades. Kind of like best metaphor is kind of like the different grades of molasses or different types of maple syrups. Yes. Yes. Now, let's talk about where the yeast come into this, because you said that it's a problematic, somewhat fermentation, so you yeah. have to be this helicopter distiller and make sure that everything's perfect. Now, what's the upshot of that? Are you using a specific yeast? So, right now, I'm doing a combination, and one is a yeast that's sourced south of the border, and it's it's just, uh, you know, uh, yeast that's tried and true for dealing with the sugars that come from the agave plant. Mm-hmm. And, and that works, but it's, you know, multiple weeks of fermentation. What? So this helicoptering is, you know, makes it even more difficult because you just have to be like very patient and wait it out. So what I've also started doing is using a champagne yeast, which is kind of known as being like a bulldozer of a yeast that'll cut through a lot of like difficult sugars and I've been using a combination of the two and I've been using them each separately and I'm trying to dial it in as to how to get it started right and then keep the momentum up to get it to finish in a manageable amount of time. Yeah, and you say several weeks for yeah. fermentation. Yeah, which for distillers is out of the ordinary. You talk to some brewers, they'll they'll put in months on products in fermentation. Uh, I can tell you from, we do not have a rye whiskey out yet, but we're working on a rye whiskey. My rye whiskey's ferment done three, yeah. day, three days. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it, it, this is just one of those things. Uh, I, I, through uh, talking with some other distillers, what I've said to them is you have to be patient and you can't be greedy. Mm. And it's really hard to do those things sometimes in distilling because a lot of people have the the theory of get maximum yields and crank it out and move on. Right. You know, in this case, even in the distilling process, I slow down the distilling process uh, with the agave and run the stills a little slower so I can make more precise cuts. And I've found that that's, very important also there's uh if if you know about distilling you know the heads and the tails are cut out Mm -hmm. and the hearts you keep what i found is when i ran agave fast there was more bleeding of heads tails and hearts i see together and uh you know it it, that that was something that just kind of reinforced to me that this is a product that you just have to be patient with Right, right. Wow. So this is a fascinating story. Um, Let's get back to the flavors here really quickly because Mm -hmm. what I find is it it follows through really well, but there's there's a little there's there's something that gets added to that kind of really soft honeyed character on the palate. I think I think it it evolves nicely. And this is going to change. This is this is an early an early take on it, so it's going to continue to evolve. And I'm yeah. This is batch one. I think. One of the interesting parts of blending different styles that are different ways of finishing this product. One thing that I taste is I do taste the barrel, which pulls a lot of vanilla. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, The, the um, smoke and the oak, I think is more coming from the French 
oak side of things and I'm getting the grassy notes from the Blanco, which mm-hmm. is, you know, le- other than a quick filtration, a very light filtration. That's all it's done there. Right. So I'm, I, and mo- probably cause I, you know, blended it. I'm, I'm noticing these things. Yeah. But there is, as you're saying them, it's like, yep. Got the spiciness. Cool. The French. Yep. Cool. Got the, uh, got the, like that, that yeah. was the change that I identified. It goes from that, like kind of like lighter honey to that deeper yeah. vanilla on the palate. Yeah. And, uh, you know, once again, like, you know, I might, I might crank up the smoke a little bit. I may not, you know, let's just get some reflections on it. You know, get I, some. I like where it's at, to be honest. <laughs> I love hearing you say that. And, you know, uh, if, if this is what we keep on rolling with going forward, I'll be so super happy. And, and it won't have anything to do with the creative process. You know, you just want people to enjoy it. Right. Well, that, that comment about cranking up the smoke leads me to kind of like the the rest of the the interview about this particular product, which is like, okay, you got this. We got batch one. The tweaks you're going to make aside, we need to roll this out now. Mm-hmm. Part of that involves being able to situate this within the agave category, regardless of where it's from. Yes, yeah. it's American agave, but yeah. guess what? It's still agave. So we yeah. need to have some sort of relation to the other kind of aspects of that category that people are familiar with. And then there's the face-to-face um, kind of conversations that you're going to need to have. And I think my feedback is like you and I like that feedback where it's like, ah, maybe don't play up the smoke. Yeah. But then the problem, right, as we said before, is it's going to make now it's like you can't really compare it to Mezcal now. Yeah. And it's it's not quite tequila because yep. it's, you know, we're doing some different stuff with it. So uh, how do you see this fitting into the agave category in general, whether that's behind the bar in like on-premise locations mm-hmm. or just for home consumers and like if you had like let's let's say that these people who are watching right now i mean maybe it's nobody i don't know, <laughs> I don't know. but there's probably some people watching right now if you had to kind of explain to them like how this fits in either behind a, an actual bar or behind the home bar what, what does that look like so in an ideal world in my eyes more people will do it more people will make an agave spirit and we actually will get a defined american agave spirit and all of us will have some similarities sure and it'll help us explain to just kind of the spirit enthusiast where we are right like american single malt wasn't a thing and now it's kind of a yes, thing yes exactly and like I, I i'd say ideally but i don't i haven't really gotten an outpouring from a lot of distillers that are like i want to do that too <laughs> but at the same time for the foreseeable future, we're going to have to explain this, right? We're going to have to tell people what it is. And I think the key thing in explaining to them the process of, or explaining to them what uh, an American agave spirit is, you have to explain to them the process of how tequila is made. Because I don't think a lot of people understand that where you say uh, it, it's the pina, the heart of the agave plant. It's cooked to release the sugars. Right. It's then mashed. Um to and and fermented upon whereas what we're getting is you know uh, agave nectar we're not getting the vegetation so please don't expect this to taste like your tequila right it has notes of that because it came from the same source so to speak and don't think it's a mezcal and that's why i say like we may amp up the smoke but i don't want to get into the point where everyone's like it's like mezcal right well it's funny too because to me this drinks like a bourbon or um aged rum drinkers spirit and i think those people when they when they taste this it will automatically make sense to them Uh, And I hope, I hope. And uh, I love to hear that because being a distiller, your work, you're always collecting raw spirit, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's how I drink is I drink raw spirit, you know, with very limited things added to it. Sure. Um, So I would hope people would embrace it as it is, but at the same time, you know, uh, uh, I, I think it's going to be real fun over the next six to 12 months to see once uh, bartenders get this in their hands, how they, where they take it to, you know, I, I just had, um, uh, just today we saw, we got a message from somebody that's like, I'm doing a jalapeno cilantro simple. Yeah. And a little citrus in this. Yeah. And we were like, Oh Yeah. That's exactly what the type of things we want to hear from people because, yep. you know, I almost love the fact that they're getting creative with our creative spirit. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I could see this going with um, Elements Honeydew Jalapeno Shrub, yeah. which you can purchase now at modernbarcart.com. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this, it, it's got a lot of potential and, and like, I, th I think what I like so much about being able to talk through this with you is there's a narrative here mm -hmm. and it's funny when, when you talk to a distiller who makes multiple different types of products as opposed to like, let's look at a, like a Sagamore mm -hmm. uh, spirit. They are, we are rye. Yeah. We do this rye, that rye, and the other rye, but it's all rye, rye, mm -hmm. rye, rye. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the narrative is, is, is pretty laid out and, and it makes sense right off the bat. But what I like is looking at a weird gin, a weird vodka, and a weird agave <laughs> spirit, yeah. and then figuring out where that through line is. I mean, for me, it's mm -hmm. the mouthfeel. For me, it's yeah. that desire to ask what more we can get out of a category. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I think there's some of that like negative capability, right? That being comfortable with uncertainty and being mm -hmm. able to say like, well, I'm making an agave spirit. Yep. It's in the agave category. People are not going to get it at first. <laughs> um, you know, I, I laugh. Uh, my, uh, my partner and my wife, I think it drives her nuts because... <laughs> She has to go out and explain this a lot more than me. So it's true, but she does an amazing job. And, <laughs> Thank and you. I think Megan's <laughs> Megan's trade show setups are always uh, <laughs> they always make me angry because I, I usually roll up to trade shows like I don't want to say hungover, but hungover and uh, <laughs> like kind of you know all kind of frazzled. And she's she's got like succulent there <laughs> and like these amazing setups. So you yeah. you do a great job at those shows. Um, I guess. What I'd like to do is uh, just give you the chance if there's anything else um, mm. you want to say about the Lobo um, for any any either industry or home consumers out there, mm -hmm. and then we'll make a cocktail with it. All right. Um, I, I, all I really have to say is I, I, if anyone out there is listening or watching this, um, I want them to contact me. Let me know what you're thinking of it. I'm yeah. on Twitter, distiller at Gray Wolf Craft. And it's my own personal Twitter feed. Uh, and I love getting feedback from people. Yeah. And that may or may not influence me with where I go on this journey. Yeah. Because as I've said several times during this interview, uh, there's a there's a, a welcomed kind of uh, open book on this right now. Mm -hmm. And we will uh, see where it goes. And I'd love to see what people are doing with it. And uh, I, I don't care if you hate it. Tell yeah. me you hate it. Yeah. You yeah. know, if, if uh, there, there was, uh, I, I, I'd made a comment in an earlier interview that, you know, we're running with the fact that don't call it tequila. And someone on Twitter said, well, they can't call it tequila because it's not made in Mexico and it's not made in the Alaska region. And like, he was a little bitter that like, I kind of just made a comment like, don't call it tequila. I love it. I love, I love that's, that. That's like a great hashtag, right? Yeah. Hashtag don't not call it. Yeah. Hashtag not, not, not tequila. tequila. You know? Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, for that guy, that was a trigger. Mm -hmm. And I like that. Like, I like that. It, it triggered someone who loves uh, spirits from south of the border. And he just kind of was like, you know, <laughs> I'm going to fire off a comment at this guy. Yeah. So, well, well uh, I think what that, I, th I feel like a great, like, graphic would be like hashtag not tequila. And then just have, like, in the corners, like, but dot 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 it's, it's like it's it's got so much to offer in that vein but it's not yeah, so it's yeah yeah it, it's and i think it i think you're probably uh developing a following of people who can kind of like get behind you in that comfort huh. with a little bit of uh pushing the edges of a category yeah. um so that, that's I mean, fantastic it's, it's funny when we were talking not tequila in the distillery for a while we were talking about how like you know you can, it's just like champagne you can't call an agave spirit tequila. Oh, yes. It's just the way it is. The AOCs uh, so are... like a few times, like when I'd be filling out my like reports at the end of the day as to what I did and all my production and stuff like that and be like, you know, product line and I'd write not tequila. <laughs> 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 and now it's become like, you know, what, like, you know, hashtag or something. Exactly. You know? Not to kill. Cool, man. Well, that's yeah. fantastic. Uh -huh. we'll, we'll get all of the socials and the, yeah. the various websites at the end of the episode. But let's, okay. I've got some, some materials right here. And right. I figured we'd just keep it simple. Yeah. Uh, we've got a south of the border spirit. It's been lightly aged. It's been mm -hmm. rested, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I figured what we'd do is we'd uh, pair it with an, uh, uh, an Americano Bianco, which is kind of in the conversation with like a uh, Lillet. Uh -huh. This one's got 
got a little bit of acidity, a little bit of uh, a little bit of nice bitterness, and some some good lemon notes. So I figured we'd take that, put it with the um, with the Lobo, and, and see what we got here. So sounds good to me. This is partially for the folks watching on uh, Instagram Live right right now, but I've got a little ice here. So for this, the recipe that I'm using, I'm gonna throw a couple of nice large cubes in mm -hmm. my mixing glass here. And for folks who are just listening, the uh, the brand that we're using for the aperitivo is the Rinomato Americano Bianco. I got this, picked this up at a, a trade show I was at recently. Uh, they were they were trying to get rid of some glasses at the end, so <laughs> I will get out my trusty steel angled measuring jigger here. Uh, it's an OXO product. I really really like using it. So we're just going to put an ounce of this. We're going to use a Manhattan ratio, right? So we're going to put one ounce of the aperitivo. And then we're gonna take the Lobo here, put in two ounces of that. It pours really nicely though. No, yeah, that's the first time I've heard that. Yeah. <laughs> I like, well, you know, those are new, new products. So. Yeah, yeah, well sometimes with these square bottles, it's a little bit hard. Yeah, like it's, it's a little a, wonky. Yeah, but yeah. Th that poured really nicely. So that, that's good for when you put a pour spout in it behind a bar, mm -hmm. people are, mm -hmm. you know, it's gonna work well. Well, so uh, I'm gonna take this, stir it up for a few seconds here. Got an army of small glasses right yes. in front of me at this point. Well, hey, that's the sign. That's the hallmark of a of a good <laughs> of afternoon. a good podcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we're just going to strain this into a couple of cool little vintage cocktail glasses that I've got. And cheers, cheers. to an exceptional new product. Thank you very much, sir. And wow, yeah, wow. It doesn't really need need no. too much, you no. know. That works perfectly with it, and it's exactly how I like cocktails. Right, you know? yeah. You, you don't need to go overboard, especially, you know, it's funny because with craft spirits, there's a lot of care put in on the front end. Mm -hmm. And you see one of the big things right now is all these cocktail competitions where you'll see these bartenders doing, well, I've got the reverse dry shake going. I've got my, you know, <laughs> aquafaba. We're doing a reverse butterfly pea flower infusion, which creates a color <laughs> gradient as it uh, soaks through the, whatever it is. Yeah. And it's just, it's the, it, it becomes obnoxious in the complexity. And I'm a guy who likes complexity, mm -hmm. but when that complexity is kind of baked in mm -hmm. to the bottle, which is kind of why, one of the reasons why you're paying a bit more of a premium for craft spirits, mm -hmm. you can feel comfortable just adding a little, you know, a yep, little yep. Blanco Aperitivo and, and some, some Lobo, and, and you've got this wonderful, like, cross-continental uh, conversation yeah. going on. Yeah, it's delicious. You ready to do some lightning round questions? Sure, fire away. All right, so drinking a cocktail right now. Mm -hmm. You're not going to offend me. What's your favorite? If it's not this <laughs> right here, what's your favorite cocktail and why? So we, we kind of talked about this earlier. I'm a distiller, and I love spirits as, on their own, mm -hmm. neat to nip at if i am going to shake it up literally or stir it up a little bit i'm just going to add a little bit of sugar a little bit of bitters and a little bit of citrus maybe like you know uh some unique uh kind of mix of uh spices sure maybe like doing like a simple that has like some peppery notes to it or something like that yeah but um i wouldn't say i would say my favorite thing to drink it's just raw spirits neat there you go. That's a distiller's answer. And, uh, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, like what you're describing is basically the origins of the cocktail. Sure, right? sure, and, yeah. And it's 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 easy for somebody, especially when you have that understanding of like base ingredients, being able to literally deconstruct the things that went into this. Mm -hmm. You can kind of do that with cocktail ingredients. And I have, I have an open mind when it comes to all cocktails. Like if someone does want to make a cocktail that has nine ingredients in it, I'll be there to help and tell them what I think of it. Right. You know, <laughs> but if you're saying to me, RB, what's your favorite way to enjoy uh, a spirit, I would say, either by itself or with minimal just accents. Right. All right. Well, so knowing that you're not a cocktail guy, I'll open up this next question <laughs> sure. a little bit for you. So if you were a cocktail or, a, sip some of my cocktail. or, a, or a spirits ingredient, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll open it up to spirits. What would you be and why? If I was a spirit, uh, I would probably, mm, I would probably be a barrel proofed <laughs> um, 
rye whiskey. Nice. And the reason why I would say that is because I like things that are hot. Mm-hmm. And I do like things that have some spice. Um, now, that's not to say that that's my favorite spirit. But I think if I was like trying to analyze myself as a spirit, right, I like would say body. Yeah. yeah. Or like if you wanted to get into ingredients, like I would be bitters. There you go. Yeah. And I would be bitters because every once in a while I'm a little sweet, but most of the time I'm a little bitter. Yeah. <laughs> and you got to be. You got to be. So many distillers. And also, there's, and on the other side of that, bitters has such a, a wide variety uh, of ways you can go with them. So there's a lot of experimentation there, and I embrace that type right, of stuff. Right, right. Bitters are shapeshifters, yeah. and, uh, yeah. and everybody, you know, most craft distillers will tell you the story of when they had to just, you know, bulldoze through a wall where <laughs> they just got told no a hundred times. And yeah, the hundred, yeah, time yeah. number 101 was that. Yeah, yeah. The, the yes, and you need that kind of like, kind of resolve, that bitter resolve to get through there. <laughs> um, if you could have a cocktail with anybody, past or present, okay. who would it be? Where would you go? What would you have? Kind of paint us a picture. Um, present, my wife, my business partner, uh, the one person that I am comfortable making a reflection on anything that lands in front of me. Mm-hmm. Um, completely open uh, with her when I taste things, what I'm, what I'm getting, what I think of it. And it also, because we work together, we come home at the end of the night and have a cocktail <laughs> and it's a great way to kind of like what, what it's meant to be. Yeah. It's a relaxation kind of like escape from the day. Yeah. And it's, it's just a celebration a, of the work that's been done during the day too, yeah. especially when you both know what that work was. Now I will tell you, I had a drink. If we talk about past in my past, I had uh, a drink with Dave Pickerell, who was the former oh. master distiller at maker's mark back in 2012. And he, was lecturing when I was training and we went out to a piano bar and had a drink after he lectured that day and I asked him some of the dumbest questions and for anyone who's listening Dave Pickerel passed away last year Mm -hmm. Uh, he was a legend in our industry and helped out a lot of craft distillers but because I had that drink and I made so many bad questions to a guy who could have probably really given me some good answers. If I could go back in the past, I would do that drink over again, but I don't think I want to drink whiskey with him this time because I think it was way over my head then and he'd still be over my head. Oh, totally. (laughs) Um, I'll tell this story now. This is no longer a lightning round because I I don't think I've told this story on the air, but um, so Dave Pickerel, a huge loss in the industry. Um, he uh, started out at Makers. Well, he didn't start out there, but he was no- <laughs> notably yeah. the head distiller at Makers Mark, uh, and then transitioned over to his pet project, which is Whistle Pig. It's mm-hmm. The brand still alive. Yep. Uh, the Seven Grand, the Jackalope Bar at the Seven Grand in LA actually has a Dave Pickerel Infinity Bottle, mm-hmm. where only bottles that Dave Pickerel bottled of Whistle Pig are going into that. So yeah. it's kind of a, a cool tribute to him. But the first time I pitched bitters to the DC Craft Bar Guild. I was, uh, it was just kind of a, the, the guild meetings happen in the middle of the day uh, and it's just at a, a, a bar at one of the people that one of the guild members runs. So I was up there and I was pitching our aromatic orange and lavender. They were in these shitty little 50 ml bottles. Uh, we were using stickers instead of labels at that point. We were just there to yeah. really get feedback and tell people that they were available. We didn't even have distribution at that point mm-hmm. in time. So I was up there. And I was sitting next to this guy who was wearing this brimmed hat. And uh, and he was like, oh, what do you do? And I was like, well, bitters, what do you do? He goes, oh, I make whiskey. <laughs> and so I, t- I poured him a little sample of our bitters. He tasted them. He was like, oh, these are really cool. And then you know, I didn't know him. I, didn't, sure. I had no clue who this guy was. But yeah. he was really nice to me. And I knew yeah. that he was the other guy presenting that day. Yeah. And so then... It's almost better you didn't know who he was. <laughs> Probably, yeah. So then he proceeds to do the Dave Pickerel thing. And at that point, that was when they were releasing the Whistle Pig uh, Old World series, which is like Sauterne cask, Port cask, Madeira cask, finished $120, $140 a bottle. This beautiful, beautiful rye whiskey that really was a, a market like buster at that point. There was really nothing like it mm-hmm. at that point. So he took 45 minutes of his 15-minute slot. <laughs> And the bartenders were just eating it up. They were like, you know, it's hero worship for them. And yeah. I was, and I, I was like, this is fantastic. I was learning a lot. And uh, so he finally gets finished. And I get up there. I'm like, hi, guys. I have some bitters. <laughs> and they're like, boo. <laughs> boo. Bring back Dave. <laughs> so it was the hardest. It was the, it was the worst. Uh, it was like the opening act 
and the main act got flip flopped. Yeah. Uh, and so it was like the coldest audience I had ever been in front of because it was just such a, such falling flat from that. But yeah, that, that Dave Pickerel, um, I just wanted to provide that context yeah. because it's important for people to, to understand like some of the big influencers and, and what they actually give to the heritage of people yeah. who are still doing it. I, uh, my Dave, the one thing I do remember asking Dave when we were having a drink uh, in Chicago was the most generic question probably someone like me could ask him, which was, what's the key to succeeding in the craft spirits world? You know, which is completely open-ended. And Dave kind of tipped that cowboy hat up and looked at me and said, Mm. make as much as you can and sell every drop. (laughs) (laughs) And I remember thinking like, wow, he in like very few words, he just told me to get to work. Right. You right. know, and uh, I'll never forget it. Yeah. You know? Well, that's a fantastic answer. Um, <laughs> getting getting into more of the advicey stuff. Are there any books that are, that, that are, were, or have been influential to you um, in the spirits, cocktail, any, any adjacent landscape? Um, you know, I talked about earlier Firewater from uh, the gang down at Corsair right. uh, influencing uh, smoking barrels to me. Um, there's uh, the Complete Distillers is where, where most people usually start. Um, if you want a real dry read, you can get textbooks on distilling. Right. Um, the one thing I will say uh, with the agave is there's a scarcity of information out there Mm -hmm. that explains to you like you know how this has been done before um my biggest resource have been other distillers who have either succeeded or failed doing it and them telling me why they did or didn't sure continue doing it kind of like an inductive thing you're building up the knowledge base yeah so you know like uh from from that standpoint you know, I, I think that's why it's still a challenge to me moving forward with the agave is because there's still a lot of uh, question marks out there is the, the best way to baby these yeast along. <laughs> right, right. Well, and if you walk it forward, I think your approach is, all right, we're going to walk it forward gradually. Yeah. Tighten it up. It's kind of like, you know, if you've ever uh, screwed something in that has multiple parts, you don't want to tighten all, like one yeah. screw all the way. Yeah. You want to kind of tighten, you know, get them in there and then tighten them all up together. Yes. And that, that creates exactly. more, you know, more exactly. flush finish. Um, I will say that um, I believe, and I hope this isn't spilling beans too soon, but I believe um, Eric Sandona, who's the president of the um, American Distilling Institute, is coming out with uh, a book about agave. Okay. Uh, specifically okay. dedicated to that. Uh, I won't say anymore because I really don't know too, too much more than that. But I, I think there's going to be some more. Um, I would love to see like, you know, some uh, some more literature be published because I think that would help grow that category of American agave spirits. For sure. Moving forward. Well, know? and especially somebody who runs, you know, a spirits judging, you know, situations mm-hmm. like, oh, I don't know if there are any American agave categories. Yeah, I mean, does this fall into distilled specialty spirit? We'll have Imagine, to imagine, right? We'll have to find out. I mean, I'm going back in February, so uh, <laughs> okay, I'll send one so with you. Get it, get it in there. <laughs> get it in there. <laughs> um, all right. So, last question is: sure. if, if you had any advice to give anybody who is getting into agave in particular, um, knowing that your product that we just sampled here is a bit of a departure in some ways mm-hmm. and and very true to form in others, it, do you have any advice about how to get into agave and how to understand it? Maybe not just as a Mexican product, but mm-hmm. as, as a product that has more to offer? I think, I think, uh, and we, we talked about this earlier a little bit, but I think patience mm. is the key with this, um, where everything from uh, learning to work with the raw ingredient to fermenting to processing and distilling, distilling and to finishing – all is a process that cannot be rushed where I think, and I don't know a hundred percent because this is batch one, but I think the biggest mistake that could be made with trying to make an agave spirit would be if somebody just tried to push it out so fast that they didn't take the time to understand the unique being that, that agave is. Um, And you know uh, that, that I think would be key. Yeah. If anyone's looking to get into it, I hope you're patient. 
Yeah, there's that Facebook directive, right? Like move fast and break things. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's yeah, there's a lot of people who kind of hear that and they're like, hell yeah. <laughs> like this this sounds great. But that in, in this situation, it just doesn't seem like that is the correct move, especially if the end goal is to create an environment that is hospitable to American agave as a category, Absolutely. which it seems like you're kind of in your own way, especially in this region, spearheading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. And and would lo love to uh, would love to see it grow and would love to see you know I bet you there'd be a lot of variations too in final products, especially when we go down the route of getting different types of agave totally. in the future uh, and people that dedicate themselves to only using dark unrefined agave mm -hmm. or something like that you know yeah. uh, the, the the future is wide open yeah masochists like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> well uh, RB I gotta say from my perspective uh, I'm really grateful that you were here to share this with, oh, with us today with, with me with our community and um, for folks here in the mid-Atlantic uh, can you tell them where they might be able to get their hands on a bottle of this the best place to, the best place to find out is just to go to our web page uh we keep up to date every liquor store uh that it that it's carried in uh we do not put down all the different bars that it's available in so just keep your eyes open you can always ask or recommend it to anyone that does not carry it that always helps us it does um but we do keep up to date on the stores where you can go purchase a bottle and if you are in the mid-atlantic and you hear this and you want to take a weekend away st michael's is a gorgeous place to come visit I do tours at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock every Saturday, and we sell it right out the front door. Beautiful. So look up the Lion Distilling Company in St. Michael's, yes. Maryland. Uh, I, it is a gorgeous drive. I've been making it myself uh, <laughs> a little bit more often recently because we've got a special little project going on that we can't yeah. really talk too much about right now. But uh, definitely the physical location is important. And just one more time, uh, the website and the social medias. Uh, GrayWolfCraftDistilling.com. You can find Gray Wolf uh, on Instagram and on Facebook. Very quick search. You'll find us right away. Uh, Twitter goes directly to me. It's distiller at Gray Wolf Craft. Distiller AT. Yeah. Gotcha. Yep. So at distiller <laughs> AT Gray Wolf Craft. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. RB, always an immense pleasure, but oh. thank you again for being on the podcast. Oh, it's always great talking to you. Hey everybody, thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and production assistance by Samantha Reed, a delicious bottle of American agave spirits courtesy of R.B. Wolfensberger and Grey Wolf Craft Distilling, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2019.